Uh, are you tired of all the things that are happening in this world and that you just want to be with God already? Well, if you are feeling that way, um, let me tell you this. What you're feeling is actually biblical. What you're feeling is actually biblical. So we turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 4 through 5. For we who are on this tent, we are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Now Paul uses the term tent as a metaphor. Okay, He's referring his body, his own body, as a tent. And um, I can remember when I went on a mission trip uh, with uh, some of the people from uh, Pasadena and El Toro. We went to uh, uh, Ensenada, Mexico, to do a one-week mission trip uh, to give VBS uh, to kids at a, at a local mission there. And I can remember sleeping in a tent for about a week uh, with 200 people. And we were sharing seven porta-potties. And I can remember that I wanted to go home. Okay, now don't get me wrong. I mean, I actually had a good time. You know, it was it was great laughing with friends. It was great having some hard you know hard time memories with them and and have and playing soccer with the kids um, when we had VBS. That was fantastic. But you know, um, you know, like I said, when you're sharing seven porta potties with two hundred people, um, that becomes very difficult. Um, the porta potties got so gross for me that it started changing my eating habits. We had about roughly three square meals a day. I told myself I would only eat one square meal a day because I didn't want to use the bathroom like that. But I did drink a lot of water, though. I did drink a lot of water. So you could imagine how I felt when I finally went back home. You know, I thank God for, for my bathroom and indoor, and indoor plumbing, right? I thank God that I have a, a comfortable bled, uh, bed to sleep in. I thank God that I was able to shower every single day. You know, those are some of the blessings that I loved because it wasn't the fact that I was, I was not clothed with a tent. I mean, I was, I, the tent provided everything I needed, protected me from the cold winter, I mean the cold winter, the cold nights that I slept in. But I wanted to be further clothed. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted you to understand how I was able to understand this passage. My tent groans, right? My tent groans. And it's not because I'm not happy with my life. It's not because you're not happy with your life. I mean, hey, you know, we live in this body and we're able to smile through trials. You know, although there are about a million COVID-19 cases, you know, we know that God's mercies are new every morning. Although there might be some violent protests, we know God's mercies are new every morning. So in, it's not that... Um, we are not clothed properly. We, we are still clothed with Christ. We could still enjoy Christ while we're here. But our soul wants to be further clothed. It doesn't want to stay in this body anymore. It wants to be clothed in eternity. And so this is what this verse is saying. It wants to be further clothed from mortality with life or eternal life. And the Holy Spirit which you receive by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, assures you that you have a home in heaven, an eternal home, that you got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. And so we see here, you know, from Scripture, that it's biblical to groan in your own tent, in your own body, because you long for eternity. You see, so that's, you know, how we're supposed to be. We sing joyfully and yet we groan. We groan because we long for that great hope that Jesus secured for us when he rose on the third day. So it's biblical to feel that way, guys. It's biblical. Now, what I want to do right now is to kind of like um, transition to what we're going to be talking about um, today. And remember from last week, we uh, went over uh, the simple gospel. What we did was we went back into the Old Testament and we went through from Genesis all the way down to Malachi to show 
that no matter what mankind did, even if God made it clear on how we can please him, our nature was selfish and was hell-bent to go against God. So there was nothing we could do to please God. However, you know, God didn't give up on us. He loved the world. And he sent his son to do something that we could not do. And when he, did, when he, came, to the, when he came on earth, he fulfilled God's law, and yet he faced the penalty that was for us. He died on the cross for us. You know, he paid that penalty, and yet he rose from the grave on the third day. On a Sunday, guys, on a Sunday. So that we could be assured that we could have eternal life with Christ. And so I, I want you guys to think about that theme because we're continuing in that theme. Today's uh, message is about the attitude of the gospel. And the attitude of the gospel is to rest. The attitude of the gospel is is to rest, is to have this resting attitude. Now, before I get deep into that text, though, I want to go ahead and lay out some foundations, okay? So the first thing I want you to understand is what I mean by rest. And we find that meaning in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. But we'll just read 7 through 8 right now. It says here, and again, he designate, designates a certain day, saying, in David, today... After such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. So verse 7 is referring to Psalm 95, verses 7 through 8. And what it's talking about is that God has a rest, a rest that's more spiritual than physical, a rest that's spiritual than physical. And I'm not saying that the spiritual is less real than the physical. Actually, the spiritual is more real. Because when you think about the physical, it's only temporary. So when we go into verse 8 and it talks about Joshua having rest, it refers to Joshua going into the land of Canaan where God promised them a physical blessing. He told Joshua that they would have the land of Canaan which flowed with milk and honey. They would have a lot of land for all the tribes where they can grow their own food. But you know, that was only a temporal blessing. It wasn't the real rest that God intended for his people. And so that's why in Psalm 95, verses 7 through 8, it says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In other words, there's a, a more real rest that God was intending, a spiritual rest. And so he was going to call them to that. So I want you uh, to further, let's go ahead and go read further and, and discover what that rest is in Hebrews chapter uh, 4, verses 9 through 10. It says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest, has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. And this is referring to the real rest that Christ obtained for us. That when he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, as a great high priest uh, coming from the line of Melchizedek instead of Aaron, when he offered himself as a propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins, then he stopped working from that point and he rested. Just as God rested on the seventh day after he completed his work of creation. So God, so Jesus also uh, rested when he fulfilled our salvation. And it's very interesting because when you think about creation, right? The world that we live in, that's not something that we did. That was a gift of God. God created the world through the word that he spoke. And much in the same way, God also created salvation by making the word, the word flesh. And by the word becoming flesh, we were able to experience salvation that God created for us. And that was rest. So just as God rested in creation, God is also going to rest in salvation because we see that Jesus Christ rose from the grave and sat down on the right hand of God. 
because all was fulfilled. It was finished. Tetelestai, right? So he wants us to experience that rest, not the temporal rest. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I want you to understand this concept of rest, okay? Because in the world that we live today, um, to obtain rest is that we have to work hard. Like, for example, if you want to have a long vacation, you got to work hard for a long time before you get that long rest. And if we want to take it further, if you want to have a good rest, you work hard, you save hard, so that you rest easy, right? So that you can retire well. And that's the concept, and there's nothing wrong with that concept. It's just that it doesn't fit. That truth does not fit with the biblical concept. The biblical concept is that you do not rely on your own work. It's not something that you do to gain that rest. It's something that God did for you to gain that rest for you. And so you put your faith in what God did instead of what you do. So that's what I mean by rest. Okay, so now that we have that sort of biblical foundation, we're going to be going into our text um, for today. And that's going to be found in Matthew chapter 11, 25 through 30. Matthew, Matthew 11, 25 through 30. So let's go ahead and read that together. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. Even so, okay. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for it comforts us and helps us to live a holy life for you. Thank you that you make it easy to live in a harsh world. I know that when, when you... When you come to us and when we come to you, the problems will still be there. And yet somehow, the problems are magically light compared to what you have for us in eternity. What once was heavy is now easy because you carry us through it. So Father, let these words be branded into our hearts. Help us to remember the attitude of the gospel and that we can find rest in you. Help us to rest in you and cease from working. Help us to be like Mary instead of Martha. Let us cease and be confident that you are working out our salvation in us and that we don't have to be afraid of losing it and that we don't have to work for it. Let us enter the re that rest today and live out that rest tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so I begin uh, back again in verse 25. And I want us to focus on that phrase, at that time. And so, at what time? What did Jesus mean at that particular time? So, what we want to do is go back to what he said before, and then lead on to this verse. So, this is what he said before. Matthew eleven twenty 20-21. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which are done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So this is sort of like a whole different message, like a contrasting message to what we just read in verse 25. In 25 it says, Oh Lord, I thank you that you revealed this message to babes and not to the wise and prudent. But you see further on at the time when he was speaking, it was almost like it sounded like, just, like judgment. So what's going on here? And I want you to understand uh, the concept or the term juxtaposition or juxtapose, okay? 
It's a very important concept because you're going to see that a lot in all art forms. Okay? Juxtaposition is when you get two items that are totally different from each other, but because they're so different, it highlights their differences to one another. Okay? So you'll see that a lot, um, not only in paintings, um, but you'll see that in photography. You will see that in, um, in gourmet cooking. You will see that in dances, in dance art forms, paintings, even in music. Just, just a position, you know, highs and lows. Those are um, important elements to help us highlight some of the differences that we see. And so what I want to do today is show you an example. And hopefully you can see this on your screen. Okay, so what I'm going to do is show you uh, this sign. And this is a yin-yang symbol. It's said to be um, a symbol of positive and negative. And the idea is that um, you have two, uh, two different forces that oppose each other. And you need to have both of them for, because if one of them is missing, the other cannot exist, right? And so there has to be balance. And so that was the idea uh, of this uh, yin-yang symbol um, in Asian culture. But what I want you to focus on is not more or less the meaning of it all, but I want you to focus on the color. And so you notice that on the right, on the right side, it's really black. But the black of the right side highlights how bright the left side is. At the same time, over at the left-hand side, we see that it's white. And the fact that it's white highlights the darkness over at the right side. And that's what we call juxtaposition. That's how you juxtapose things. And, and naturally, your mind does that, right? You see, you don't really say it out loud, but in your mind, you see those differences, okay? Now we're going to go with something more complex, and I hope you can see this photograph as I go ahead and show this to you, okay? So here's our next one here. And that's juxtaposition in photography. And I don't, I don't even have to tell you what that means because you already see it in your heart. It kind of affects you, right? And that's one of the artistries. If you're, if you're really artistic about a lot of things, when you juxtapose things, you draw a reaction from people, okay? So, um, but what I want to do right now, I'm not going to explain the meaning of this photo. I'm just going to kind of like explain some of the elements that you see. So uh, above... Above the picture, you see a, a lady at rest, right? And in order for you get to get that rest, you see that the ad charges you, right, um, how to get that kind of rest. But over at the bottom, you see another kid relaxing who doesn't have that kind of money, right? And, uh, and that's it. That's juxtaposition. That's juxtaposition. So when you think of um, any art form, even poetry, Juxtaposition has a way of like drawing a reaction from you. It makes you, um, you're able to see um, what, whatever that's evil there, very evil. But that very evil makes whatever is good, very good, okay? In gourmet cooking, in gourmet cooking, you can see, you can see like, for example, when something is very, very sweet, right? It is accented with something that's sour, right? So somehow you're able to taste these uh, accented, um, accented flavors with these contrasting or juxtapos juxtaposed flavors. So um, anyway, now that you understand the, the, uh, the idea of juxtaposition, let me go ahead and bring you back to this verse. It says, And then he began to rebuke the cities in which, they, in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works, I want you to focus on that, mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And then we see it again right before verse 25. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you have been done, done in Sion, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment for you. And this, wow, that's like a very impacting message. 
So I highlighted the purpose. You know, I highlighted mighty works for you to understand this idea. You see, the mighty works that Jesus did was evidence that Jesus had a relationship with the Father. The mighty works that Jesus did was evidence that they had a relationship with the Father. But you know what they did? When they looked at Jesus' mighty works, they didn't want to put their faith the Pharisees did not want to put their faith in the work of Jesus. They want to put their faith in their work for the law. You see, they believed that their relationship with God is more solid than Jesus' work because they think that by this outward appearance of obeying the law, they have a relationship with God. They even talk to Jesus like that and say, we have we have our Father, and our Father is God. And Jesus turns around and says, no, it's not. Your Father is the devil, right? So you, you wanna, I want you to understand. He's saying that these mighty works that Jesus did, they did not want to believe that he came from God because they trusted in their pride. They trusted in their own works, their own works, that they had a right relationship with God. That's what was going on here. And so we're going to see further on in this passage what, what he means by rest, right? We're going to see that later on. But I want you to understand uh, the effect in it. And if you don't believe me that these Pharisees, that these Pharisees trusted in their works to have a right relationship with God, let me give you a, a parable of what Jesus said about the Pharisee. It said in Luke chapter 18, verses 11 through 12, the Pharisee stood up and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. So he's talking about his obedience or outward obedience to the law. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So that was the thinking of that day with Jesus that they trusted in their own works, that their own obedience to the law. That's why they always had a bone to pick with Jesus, because when Jesus chose to heal on the Sabbath day, they got mad and said, you're a devil because you're breaking God's law. In their pride, in their own blinded arrogance, they refused to look, that, to look at the fact that Jesus did come from God from his works. And so that's what their thinking was. Instead of keeping it simple, they complicated it by trying to obey the law. So now I go ahead and go into more of what he said in that chapter we just read. So at that time, right, at the time he spoke all this judgment, he juxtaposes it, right, and says this, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Who are the wise and prudent? We're not talking about the, the wisdom of God and the prudent. We're talking about those who are leaning on their own understanding. We're talking about those who think they know that they have a right relationship with God according to the works of the law. That's what we're seeing here. That he thanks God that he revealed this truth to babes instead of those who were blinded by their own pride and arrogance of what they were doing with God's law. And so I want you to, to, I want to give you an example of what a babe looks like, okay? And what a babe looks like is a blind man just being healed by Jesus. One day when you go, uh, when you get into the book of John, the disciples came by and they saw a blind man and they said, Jesus, who sinned? Was it his parents or was it him? And then Jesus says, neither. You know, he was trying to go against what the Pharisees were thinking because they said, because if, the reason why that person is messed up is because somebody sinned about it, right? So Jesus said, neither, but that the work, but that the work of Jesus, a work of God can be shown and be displayed. That was the purpose, guys. So you can understand when you go into Matthew where he says, woe to you for the mighty works, because they trusted in their own work instead of God's work. And I want you to understand that that principle of trusting your own work instead of God's work, instead of what Christ did for you, is a principle that continues to be used in this world today. So anyway, let me show you what a babe looks like, all right? This is how a babe answers. You're going to love this. It says in John chapter 9, 30 through 31, The man answered and said to them, Why 
this is a marvelous thing. He's talking to the Pharisees that you do not know where Jesus is from, yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And what this babe said was a stinging, was a stinging reaction to the Pharisees. It stung. Because it's almost like saying, you know what? You guys were all telling me that you have a right relationship with God, but it turns out that he doesn't hear you, so you're not really worshiping God at all. I don't know who you're worshiping, but you're not really worshiping God at all. So the Pharisees got really angry, right? Anyway, um, I want you to focus on what this uh, babe said. He said in verses 32 to 30, 33, Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so this Pharisee understood. <coughs> he put his faith in God's work. He knew that that was from God. But the Pharisees, because they believed in their own work in obeying the law, they could not accept God's work. And so when this, this babe was telling the Pharisees, or in a way was, was correcting the Pharisees' thinking, saying, you know, you probably aren't worshipers of God, and, you know, it's quite obvious that you don't know where he's from, because, you know, to me it's very clear, this guy is from God, because nobody can do what this guy can do. No one in history could ever do this. So look at how the Pharisees react. They answered him and said to him, you're completely born in sins, and you're trying to teach us? You see the hubris that they had? You see the pride that they had? Because you know what? They trusted in their own body of work, of their own relationship with God, that they earned their relationship with God through the obedience, the outward appearance of the law. So it wasn't necessary to believe in Jesus' work. As a matter of fact, they put it down. And so I, I want you to remember the passage I just read to you. I just gave you that as a clear example of what a babe looks like. It says, and, and Jesus, and at that time, Jesus said, And Lord and Father, I thank you that you reveal this to babes and not to the wise and the prudent. You see? So the, the, uh, the babe is a person who puts their trust simply in the work of God. Later on in that story, if you read the book of John, you're going to love it. So the blind man doesn't know what Jesus looks like. All he remembers is that somebody, you know, opened up his eyes by putting clay in his eyes, right? That's all he remembers. So he walks around and Jesus comes to him and he says, do you want to believe in the Son of God? And he's like, who is he so I can believe him? And Jesus says, and not on his own work because his own work says that he was blind. But because of Jesus' work, he was once blind, but now he sees, right? And we call that amazing grace. So I, I want you to understand the juxtaposition again, right? I know I'm repeating that phrase. You're probably going to hear it a lot, and you're probably going to see a lot of juxtaposition as you walk in your daily life. But how he's contrasting the statement about God revealing this truth to babes instead of the ones who thought, that by your own work, you could obtain salvation. So here it is in verse 26. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. So it was good that the babes understood. It's almost like it's juxtaposing babes and older people, right? It was, um, it was good that God revealed that truth to the babes, to the ones that used to be blind but now can see, versus the ones that think they can see but are still blind in their sins, okay? It was good to God. And I want you to understand this phrase because, um, like, for example, if I was reading this te text and I said something like, blah, 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 Luke Skywalker, immediately your thought goes to Star Wars, right? Immediately, that's what it is. So I, I want you to understand that when you read New Testament, that sometimes there are fr certain phrases that will make you echo back into the Old Testament. So when was the first time when the Father said, and when I saw it, and it was good, right? So that should take you back to Genesis, right? So I want you to understand here, it's as though what you're seeing right now is that God, through the, Jesus Christ, through the word that was spoken, it's like, let there be salvation. Let me, let me save my people, right? And Jesus appears, right? 
And so he saves his people. It's like his, it's God's work, right, that made the world. It's God's work that created salvation. And so when he saw that salvation was made through Jesus Christ as he spoke these things, what did God say? I saw salvation, and it was good. So that's what I want you to get from that, right? That God uh, saw that it was good, that babes were able to see salvation just by putting, just by just trusting in God's work instead of trusting their own work to obtain salvation. And you kind of see a lot of those things, like those concepts, especially when you look at Adam and Eve, right? Instead of putting their faith in what God told them, they trusted in their own work to know good and evil. And as a result of it, they worked to pull out that fruit and ate it. And as a result, they sinned, right? So I, I want you to see those, those concepts. They, they kind of like echo in. Oh, I shouldn't say echo in. They kind of repeat themselves in a metaphorical way. So um, he says that by revealing to the babes salvation, it was a good thing, just like creation. And so now we go into something that it almost seems like a digression, but it's not. But it states an important fact concerning salvation. It's very important. I don't want you guys to miss this. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now, this is what I want you to understand. And this is why I had to use that juxtaposition phrase and go back to that phrase and highlight mighty works and the Pharisees and stuff like that. Because what Jesus is saying right now is that it doesn't matter what you do. No matter what work you put in, it's not my own theology or doctrine. I don't care how many times I read the Bible. It's not my knowledge. No matter how much I know about God through my own personal effort, I cannot obtain salvation. I cannot do it. You know, the only time I can get salvation is when God come to God and say, God, I can't see a thing. I can't see you. Open my eyes to the wondrous things of your law. And when I come to him, he opens my eyes and guess who I see? I see God. I see Jesus. And that's the only time because it's His work. It's His work that allows me to see these things. You see, that's the principle that I want you to understand. That's what's being expressed in this passage. And um, I know this is doctrinal, right? This is a very doctrinal statement. But, um, you know, um, later on, you know, Peter says, you know, um, where can we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And Jesus says, you, would have not, you wouldn't have known that unless the Father revealed that to you. And it says here later on, you know, I can't reveal, you, wouldn't know the, you wouldn't know the Father unless the Son reveals them to you. So I want you to see sort of like the, tri, the triunity, right? The Trinity and how they're working together so that you can see God. All right, But the, the heavy emphasis that I want to put on is that God has to open your eyes so that you can see who God is. It doesn't matter how much you try to obey the law. It doesn't matter how morally right you could be and how you follow through it. Remember, there was a rich young ruler who said, you know, I've kept the Ten Commandments. But then God opened his eyes and showed him, oh, really? Well, how about this? Why don't you just give up everything? Because you love me, just give up everything and just follow me. Sell everything. And then he, and he turned away because his heart was in his riches instead of God. You see, he relied on his own work, on his own work for happiness, his own work to have righteousness with God instead of just simply trusting God. So, anyway, this doctrinal statement simply says about your salvation that it has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do about God's will. It has everything to do with Him opening your eyes. Have you noticed that pattern in Genesis 2? Could, could Adam make himself alive? Could he even form himself? Could he even think about how he's going to appear? No. It was God that formed him out of dust. And it was God that spoke in the breath of life. And Adam became a living soul. All this that you see here, when God reveals these things, especially when a person wants to repent, those are gifts from God. Just as what you see in Adam, 
That was a gift of life from God. Salvation is also a gift. The having even the feeling of, of needing repentance, of wanting to say, you know, Son of David, have mercy on me. That's a gift from God. Because there are people that will stay blind because they think they see, you know. So I want you to understand uh, what this doctrinal statement is telling us here. And so now uh, we get into what, uh, what I wanted to express, what we call the attitude of the gospel, right? The attitude of the gospel. In verse 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the idea that Jesus was saying, again, using the concept of juxtaposition, is that you don't work. You don't work for your salvation. All you got to do is come to me. You come to me, and instead of working, you're going to find rest for your soul. <coughs> and you will find rest. <coughs> so um, I want you to kind of like um, go back to what we just read. Remember, it started off with judgment, and then now he's, 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 he's coming in with an invitation. Doesn't it sound like how we hear like these street preachers that are like, you're going to go to hell in your sins, right? <coughs> Judgment. But then they say, but it doesn't have to be that way. But if you, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can go to heaven and not experience God's wrath, right? So here, it's almost the same concept. Jesus says, woe to you because you don't believe in the mighty work. But then he also gives out the invitation and says, come to me, all you who are working so hard for salvation. Come to me, and I will give you rest. And here's the cool thing that I want to tell you. In the English, it says, I will give you rest, and rest is a noun. But did you know that that's not how it's said in the Greek? In the Greek, this is how it says it. I will rest you. It's not a noun. It's a verb. I will rest you. In other words, um, when God looks at you working hard for salvation, being right with God, he says, stop, stop, and I will rest you. In other words, he puts rest on you. You don't obtain this rest. God does this work in you so that you rest. It's like he makes you rest. That's what this text is saying. Come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will rest you. It's a verb. He makes you rest. You know, it's like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me besides the waters. He rests us, you see. That's what he does. He makes you lie down. He makes you lie down. So, uh, so that's why this is very, it's so good that it was written in Greek. Because the literal translation is, I will rest you. It doesn't sound right in English. But that's what it says in Greek. So again, it's a heavy emphasis. You cannot obtain that rest on your own. God must rest you. He must rest you. And so the attitude of rest, right? It's to not worry, right? That's why God says, don't worry about these things because it's almost like an effort to try to make, to try to make a life. But God says, can you stop? Because I already did it all. Can you look at, the, can you look at that flower, the lily of the valley? You know, it doesn't even have to work. Because I clothed it. Do you see the birds that eat the seeds over there? They don't worry because I feed them. So it's the same thing with you. So let me rest you guys. Stop it. Stop working so hard. Come to me, all you who are heavy, and are, are, uh, uh, all who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will rest you. Let me rest you. So that's what he's saying there. And so we go on to verse 29. We're talking about God's rest, right? The attitude of the gospel is rest. The attitude of the gospel is rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls. Now, this is what I want you to understand. Yoke. And I've been taught that the yoke was like, when there's a yoke, they have two oxen and there's a bigger oxen the stronger oxen, there's a younger oxen. And so when you put the younger oxen on the, on the lighter yoke, on, on the yoke, the bigger oxen is the one that's doing all the work, right? That's how I understood it. 
But then when you go back to the book of Matthew, remember, well, what's, what's the theme of the book of Matthew? What have I been always saying about the book of Matthew? Jesus, king of the Jews, right? So Jesus is a king, and we are his subjects or servants, right? So let me ask you this. Does a king wear a yoke? Or does a, yoke, does a king put the yoke on his on servants? That's what I want you to understand. And um, I don't want you just to understand based on the context of this, but the Old Testament tells you exactly what the yoke is. Here we go back in Genesis. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. And that's talking, that's Isaac talking to Esau because Esau, because Jacob took the blessing, right? And so Esau was to serve Jacob. But there's going to come a point in time where Esau gets tired of Jacob and so he's going to stop serving him. So the yoke is symbolic of service, right? The yoke is symbolic of service. So when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, it doesn't have the idea that, you're, that Jesus has a yoke. And he, then you, it, it's not that, okay? And I'm going to express what I mean by that later. But I want you to understand the concept that the yoke represents servitude. The yoke represents servitude. It says in Leviticus 26, 13, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. In other words, that yoke of bondage was symbolic of Egypt. They were serving Egypt. Remember how they served in Egypt. Just, just go watch the Prince of Egypt, that, that movie, right? And you see Israel having the yoke of bondage. But Jesus breaks that yoke of bondage, right? But later on, I mean, I'm sorry, God breaks that yoke of bondage. But later on, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. I'm going to go into that uh, in a second. I just want you to understand this, what this yoke means. And finally, in 1 Kings 12 through 4, this is what you hear from um, the people talking to King Solomon's son. That's Rehoboam. And you're going to find out how King Solomon treated his servants. So it says, your father, King Solomon, made our yoke heavy. Ooh, interesting. Made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. And so they, they weren't saying in, in a literal sense that King Solomon put a heavy yoke on them, but they used it as an example, as a metaphor, representing how King Solomon kind of like gave him a lot of work to do to keep this country to become great, you know? And so they're asking that he would, they would lighten the yoke, right? Lighten the yoke. What they didn't realize is they were supposed to talk to Jesus about that, not Rehoboam, because it shows you the nature of, of, of humanity, right? You know, what they, you know what Rehoboam told him, told these people? He says, you know what? You tell me to lighten your yoke, but guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to make it heavier. I'm going to make it way heavier. My dad used to whip you with just regular whips, but I'm going to whip you with scorpions. You know, that's how he talks. That's human nature. That's how they rule. But Jesus says, stop working. Stop working. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, the king, the master says, take my yoke. Put this on. Because any yoke you wear is going to be heavy. But when you wear my yoke, it's much easier. And this is what I want you to understand. It's not Jesus wearing the yoke and then you wearing it with him. It's Jesus putting on, letting you putting on that yoke that he gives you. How do you know that? Because in the New Testament it says this. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You took the yoke upon you because it's lighter that way. Because when you put on the, the yoke of sin and bondage, it's heavier there. It's harder there. You know, and, and Egypt has been metaphorically represent the world and you saw how heavy it was to serve them to the point that they even forgot how heavy it was that they were long the onions and leeks back in Egypt right but it was heavier then but you know when you put on the yoke of Jesus yeah he's going to allow you to go through the wilderness maybe you're going to get thirsty sometimes you know but if you just trust in his work and not your work alone he's going to bust a rock where you can drink water 
Yeah, you don't have any food, right? They had no food at all, but all they had to do was simply trust him. And guess what he did? He rained manna, bread from heaven, to trust in his work, not on your own work. You see, that's what he was trying to get them out of. They've been so used to trusting their own work of what they can do for God instead of just trusting God's work instead. So what I'm, what I mem remember, the purpose of the sermon is to bring out the attitude of the gospel. And what's the attitude of the gospel? Rest. Rest, guys. Rest. So that's what I want you to understand. And so anyway, this yoke again is a powerful concept because you know that the disciples, I mean, the, the authors of, uh, of the New Testament bring up this concept a lot. Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, because he put on the yoke, you see. The bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. You also see the brother of Jesus, James. The brother of Jesus, James. You know what he says? James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ and the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. So it's as though these apostles, these writers, obeyed Jesus' word. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Okay, I'm going to be your bondservant because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I'm going to put it on, Jesus. So they put it on him. So again, we read here, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So again, I want you to picture Jesus putting that yoke on you, saying, okay, now you have that yoke, you belong to me. You are my servant now, and I am responsible for you. I will take care of you. Don't we have a song that we sing at prayer meeting? Uh, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. That's him putting that yoke on you. Or if you want to put it this way, I know it sounds mean, but he puts a leash on you, and then he guides you, right? And he's very gentle, you know, he's not, he doesn't yank on that yoke and, and, and it kind of whips you, makes you do things for him. That's not how he is. You know, it's as though like, you know, he, you're, this, you're this loving animal and he wants to take care of you. You know, he wants to guide you to good things. The idea of putting on that yoke, okay, you know, and I know I've used some really strong terms, slave of slint, slave of righteousness, and slavery has sort of like a bad rap for it, especially since, well, dude, our history made slavery to be a very bad thing. Let's be clear about that. But I want you to understand that slavery wasn't necessarily a bad thing. When you look into Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 16 and 17, you see a person wanting to be a slave of his master. Why? Why? Because he loves his master. Because the master was gentle and, and, and loving towards that person that he realized if I live on my own, it's going to be harder. So i rather live with this master. It says here in verse 16, and if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you, this is the bondservant, because he loves you in your house since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant you shall do likewise. And so we call this voluntary slavery. And this person chose to be a lifetime servant to his master. Why? Because his master was very good and gentle and lowly in heart. And actually it was better for him to stay with his master than to be on his own. You see, that's why he chose that. The all is sort of like that symbol, symbol of putting that yoke saying, this servant belongs to me now. And because I'm his master, I am responsible and I need to take care of him. And so normally this happens when the master looks at his servant and he sees, man, you know, I, I feel bad for him. He, he works really hard. I'm going to go find him a wife. And so he finds him a wife and then he's able to have a family. And so he says, you know what, you've been so good to me. You've still been good to my family. I don't want to leave you guys. I don't want to leave you, Master. I'm going to stay with you. And so the picture when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, that's what it's picturing, okay? That's what it's picturing. So anyway, um, again, I know I'm, I'm reemphasizing this again. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, 
and you will find rest for your souls. That just simply describes our king. And finally, we go with the final verse. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And why is this burden, why is this burden easy and light? It's because we love our master. And when we serve him, it doesn't feel like a burden. You know, um, I don't know how to put it, but maybe it almost looks easy when I, when I preach, but it's not that it's easy. It's because Jesus makes it very easy for me. He does. You know, he shows me and guides me where I need to look to find that revelation. Because, you know, honestly, it's not by my wisdom that I preach these things. It's through the Holy Spirit. And so I found that being a slave to God is a whole lot easier than being a slave to myself. Can you imagine, you know, Anthony boasting on his computer science degree from Cal State Dominguez Hills and boasting about his Bible studies degree from, Cal, uh, from Calvary Chapel and, and kind of going through all this intellectual gymnastics to go ahead and give you a sermon? Can you imagine that? You know, like, you guys would probably get confused and probably tune out on me. I'm the only one that understands that. But you know, by the work of God, by the Holy Spirit, He makes it easy for me. I don't have to rely on what I know. All I got to do is just let the Scripture speak for itself and just have him, have him open my eyes. I tell him, God, I'm blind to this. Open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things of your all. It's like I'm blind Bartimaeus each time I read the Word of God and say, God, have mercy on me. You know, I'm blind, have mercy on me. Let me see. I can't see. And you know what happened? Amazing grace happened. I once was blind, but now I see. And that's how you rest in God. That's the attitude of rest. And so as we go through life, there's a, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have some tough times ahead of you. All right? But I don't want you to focus on those tough times. I want you to focus on God's word. And what does God's word say? Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Learn from me because I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you're going to find rest for your souls. So this is the attitude of the gospel, guys. We're not, we're not being so tense and, and, and like we have to do something or else something bad's going to happen. We're not like that. We are rest assured because we are confident that God already did it all, and so we don't have to do anything at all. He did it all, so we do nothing at all. So that's the attitude of the gospel. But I don't know if that's everybody here, though. Maybe you're tuning in for the first time. Maybe um, a friend invited you to the stream, and maybe you've been feeling the pressure of trying to be right with people, trying to be right with God, and, and you find that you can never be perfect. Sometimes you disappoint people, and you probably disappoint God a lot. Do you want to find rest for your soul? Do you want to find that rest? Well, let me go ahead and show you the way. It says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So two things that you must do. You need to repent and believe in the gospel. And what does it mean to repent? It means you've got to stop thinking that you can impress God with what you do. You got to change your mind. You got to stop thinking that, you know, what you think is good uh, is actually good for God because maybe it isn't. What you have to do when you repent is that whatever the Bible says is good, you agree with God that it's good. And whatever God says is bad, you agree with God that it's bad. That's what it means to repent. It's literally saying, God, I'm going to make you my king. I'm not, I'm not going to judge what good and evil is for me anymore. I'm going to let you judge good and evil is for me. I'm tired of working and judging what good and evil is for me, so I'm going to give you that job. You know, you do it for me and judge what good and evil is for me. That's what it means to repent. So now that you have that attitude of repentance, right, to turn away from your sin, then you have to believe in the gospel. And the gospel is John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so to believe in the gospel, right, is to understand that Jesus Christ is God, but he became a human being when he came to earth. And he became a human being uh, on earth so that he can pay the penalty from your sin. And so he died on the cross. He suffered on the cross 
for our sins, experiencing the wrath of God for us. But at the same time, He rose again on a Sunday, on the third day, to assure us that that same thing can happen to us if we simply put our faith in the work that Jesus did for you. Do you want to enter His rest? You could enter His rest by repenting and believing in the gospel. Now, some of you...